Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Soda Pop Podcast. I'm Mark. And I'm Lainey. And today we actually have another UNA employee with us. We have um, Mr. Daniel Stevens here. He's a professor of music, and he actually teaches the um, viola and the violin, to be more specific about that. But um, today we're going to talk a little bit about the UNA and um, Shoal Symphony kind of partnership that we have here. So, um, first of all, how long have you been here at UNA? Uh, this is uh, my fifth year. I can't believe I've already been at UNA for five years. I know, and I was a professor at another college in Kansas for eight years before that. So, oh, wow. my 13th year as a professor. Mm. Wow. So, you've been here for five years now. How long have you been a part of the symphony? Have you been a part of the symphony the entire time that you've been here? Or I even have. before? Actually, when uh, when they hired me, they hired me to come be the, the Scholl Symphony Orchestra conductor um, and to be a professor at UNA. And uh, it's really unique how the, the symphony and then a professional board outside of UNA comes together, and they really share the responsibilities of building this orchestra. Okay. Well, I know also the arts around the Scholls have been growing in the recent years. And even though you've only been here... I, I mean, it's not really been a short amount of time, but it's shorter than a lot of people have been at the university. How have you kind of seen the symphony grow in your time here? Uh, it's been tremendous. Um, my predecessor was, was a fine musician and a great conductor, and uh, he really built the level of the orchestra as far as the talent pool. Um, and really the, the professional side, he really worked with professional musicians well. Um, UNA at the time just didn't have a lot of string students at UNA. They had a lot of talented winds, brass, and percussion students. Um, but uh, as far as recruitment and growing the string side, that just wasn't as much his gift as the musicianship that he did so well. Um, and so when they brought me in, I had always been known as a program builder, you know, getting to know people, uh, trying to um, get buy-in and trying to get people to want to invest and, and grow the symphony together. Um, since then, I was actually just looking at numbers this morning for another project and noticed that uh, when I first started, there were about 35 UNA students involved in the wow. symphony. And today we have 67 students on the uh, scholarship roster. Wow, of, that's of the a really symphony big orchestra. growth. So just in five years, it has really taken off. Um, and there, we're at a point now where there are some sections of the orchestra where there's waiting lists and we can't accept all the students because you, you have to have a certain balance yeah. within the orchestra. Wow. Wow, that's that's impressive. <laughs> been pretty fun. the The other side of growth, I mean, um, when you just talk about the, the the finances or the financial side of the orchestra, um, the, the the project we're going to talk about here in a minute, this one of these film shows, is very expensive to produce. Mm -hmm. And when I first came here, the budget of the entire symphony together, I'm talking both internally with UNA and externally, wasn't even enough to put on one show of this film uh, of this nature wow. with the Disney. Um, and so now today we have about quadrupled the budget just in that amount of time in five years. So. Wow. Um, it's it's more than just building students and a student ensemble. It's more than just building the professional quality of the orchestra. It's it's also been about uh, building community support, uh, developmental support, having corporations and individuals say, "Wow, I can really get behind this and be passionate about it and wow. willing to give to it, so we can do some cool projects." Oh, That's yeah. really good, and I know like the community is a really big part of this as well. And I know that they they're really enjoying it because I've looked at some numbers that you guys have put up, and I mean like the Home Alone show that you guys did, mm -hmm. which is uh, another one of these film shows. It was like pretty much sold out. It was a complete sellout. Yeah. So Norton seats uh, 1,650 people, and it's always exciting to to have those shows completely full to the very top of Norton. You know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the plus and minus. The sad part is that it's such an expensive so show to produce. You have to sell it out. I mean, yeah. you have to even yeah. pay it off. You know, oh, yeah. you, you wish you'd made a big profit off of it, but um, but it, it, it build, definitely brings an excitement to our campus that that is neat for me to see and to see a lot of faculty and staff and administrators just wanting to come together and, and celebrate what, what the orchestra does. And I think that's kind of crazy because for those of you who don't actually come here to UNA or those of you who are going to, um, for reference to that, normally a lot of the times we don't use the upper levels of Norton, but every time the symphony uses it, they pretty much sell it out and use the entire building. And that's a lot of people for yeah. Florence. That's a lot of people. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's pretty fun. I mean, it's it's really neat to see you know the community wrap around uh, the orchestra and 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 just the various projects that we do. We actually perform in a lot of interesting venues. Um, you know, Norton is what we consider our home, and we're there most of the time, at least five or six times in the year. Um, 
But then we, we've had some unique places this year we've also sold out. Uh, we took one concert for the first time out to, of all places, it's called the Rattlesnake Saloon. I don't know if you've oh, been yeah. there before. Yeah. yeah. It, it is this beautiful, natural cavern um, in the south side of the Shoals, about 30, 45 minutes away. And uh, we brought in these two Berkeley artists that did all these contemporary styles. You know, they were fiddle players, and they uh, played contemporary jazz, and they, they write their own music. And they write it for uh, themselves as soloists with a backup orchestra. And so we, we pulled all of that show together and did it under this natural amphitheater cavern and sold five, oh, 600. Wow. We maximized that space as well. Um, we had to bring in a video screen just for some seating that couldn't even see the stage. And, um, and uh, it was just so neat because one, these two soloists from Berkeley, one is, is a violin fiddle player, the other is a cellist. And what he would do is he would take um, like loop pedals and do things, and he would he would make all these sound effects on his instrument. So he he would lay down a rhythm track just like any contemporary pop artist or anybody would, and then he would play back with himself, um, and uh, would do things like. Um, uh, he had one song just that was all about whale sounds. It was cool. Wow. So we had this track of whales, and then he was doing these cool glissando effects on his cello, and it, it was it was just really something to see. And so it, it's it's rare, let me tell you, that I mean to get any kind of university orchestra program for them to be able to experience different styles and contemporary styles of music. Um, you know, a lot of big city centers will have the university orchestra and the professional orchestra, but they are never combined. I mean, we're one of just a couple in the nation that have this kind of model where we can give students that professional experience, sit right next to faculty. We have, at any given concert, maybe 12 to 14 faculty that perform in the ensemble too, right next to the students. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very rare when you can say you can work with them in the field. Yeah. And uh, it's, it, it's really fun for, for everybody. Yeah, and we, we've talked about how um, the Shoals is just really Really, like loves and you know knows the symphony and it's been around for decades now and it's grown and everything and so we were just wondering how does it feel to be part of such an honored and loved organization well I, I'm, I'm really the honored one I mean because I stepped into a wonderful situation and a wonderful tradition that was already here um, if I remember the history a little bit since I've only been here five years I've, <laughs> I've got to try to remember it. but I it started back um, 1979 or so, they were trying to put together what they considered kind of a community school program just for mm -hmm. beginning mm -hmm. strings. And then in the 80s, I think, is when they first started presenting their first concerts. Mm -hmm. But it was more of a, you know, it was out in Spring Park in Tuscumbia, and it was a just community ragtag, let's just, you know, do something to, to teach kids how to play or kids and adults how to play, you know, mm -hmm. string instruments. Um, and from there, it evolved into more of the community orchestra model uh, 25 years ago. Um, but really, it's only in the last 15 or 20 years did it really become more of a semi-professional to professional mm -hmm. model of orchestra. Yeah. Um, th there were a lot of f funny things I, we laugh about now but that, what, that I had to, to bring into play when I first started five years ago is they didn't even do online ticket sales, for example. That was just five years ago. They, they were using just single ticket cards, and they'd sell them at the door, and um, and I said, we really need to move this direction. It took took months for the board to, to try to shift mentality of thinking more globally than just locally. Um, and uh, here, I mean, just five years later now, 75% of our ticket sales are online, you know, yeah. like you'd expect. While we're kind of talking about the history here, I kind of want to know, like, the UNA is kind of merged with the with the Scholl Symphony. Um, so the Scholl Symphony Association, how did they come to partner with UNA? Do you know a little bit about that? Yeah, just, just a little bit. I mean, it really took the vision of the board at the time, uh, many of which members are not on the board anymore because it's, uh, it's, it's a relatively young board for the symphony. Um, but uh, we, we called the association, but we went back and looked a, a a few months ago, and there isn't the official association title. It's it's titled the Scholl Symphony Orchestra by itself. This this separate 501c3 board um, of professionals in our community um, have about uh, I believe 19 members on that board that make professional decisions, especially the programmatic decisions like what types of concerts do we want to bring and what do we want to pay to to provide on the professional aspect. And then there's the the UNA element, and I've I've always loved to celebrate that it's an equal 50-50 partner. I I never want it to be where one partner has more control over other or shifting priorities because um, I think that check and balance has been wonderful because UNA is really supporting the student and the student drive and uh, the uh, um, 
try, trying to give them a path forward on, on finding professional experience before they reach the, the professional world full time. Mm-hmm. And then the professional side, we're there to generate revenue and to sell tickets and to provide some of these fun film opportunities and other concerts that are just like, wow, inspire a new generation into to orchestral music, you know. Um, it's so easy to think of, of orchestra music as, you know, people are worried about this, like the stuffiness of Bach or Mozart or just, you know, ooh, I, I just don't know, I only do that when I study for tests or, you know, something like that. Um, but, but it really has evolved over the years, you know. Um, and there's a lot of crossover. I mean, every pop major pop artist does a lot of crossover work with, with orchestras. Um, obviously, movies still have full orchestra soundtracks at the L.A. Hollywood Bowl Orchestra and things. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I don't know if the two of you grew up in the South a lot, but just the South mentality, there's a lot around bands and marching bands, and, and I really celebrate my colleagues what they've grown on the band side of UNA. Um, so I think when I came in five years ago, it was, okay, how do we get an orchestra program to be just as honored and celebrated as the wonderful marching program that we've had for many years? Um, and so that's what I, what I set out to do. Now, you've also talked about some of the like film um, music that y'all been able to do. So y'all have actually done a lot of scores from popular Disney movies yes. and the Home Alone with the 20th Century Fox uh, movie as well. So what was the reason behind this, and will it be kind of recurring? For them? Yeah, you know, what's, what's really unique, this this will be our fifth film since I've been here. I, that's, that's hard to believe, too. Um, and to give you a taste on the commitment that the professional board has had to, to uh, to see that vision and to move forward. Um, when you call out to Disney LA, for example, and they have a, a whole division of just orchestra concerts, um, and they said just 10 years ago they may have had 40 of these performances a year, and now they have over 400 a year of orchestras performing these wow. films live. And these are just Disney films. Then you've got all the other films from the <laughs> other movie houses too. Um, but uh, w- when I, uh, w- when you just call to... The, these agents and you ask them what it would cost to put this on, the first thing I do is they say, well, we started asking $35,000 in royalty for one performance. Mm-hmm. And that's just for the honor to get to perform it. That doesn't mm-hmm. cost what it does to actually produce it. It's just mm-hmm. the royalty rate you have to pay up front to get to produce the show. So they start with $35,000. And then they say, mm-hmm. okay, then you have to bring out our video producer from LA and that's another $10,000 fee. Then all of your local tech, you've got to build a 40-foot screen. You've got to bring in big speaker stacks. You need to mic, put 40 microphones in an orchestra, and you need someone to run all the sound and the video and all of that all together. That's another eight to ten thousand dollars. And then you've got the orchestra musicians, the professional musicians. You have to pay on stage, so ten, fifteen thousand. So most professional orchestras have to pay seventy to eighty thousand dollars for this one night wow. to get to produce it. Wow. And so as you can see, selling yeah. out is is integral to being able to do the next one, the next one. Um, but um, we were so fortunate. UNA has been so fortunate in this whole process in that um, I remember um, I first played the very first Pirates of the Caribbean show when I was a uh, full-time orchestra musician. Now, this may have been, gosh, ooh, I'm, I'm scared to say now, 16 years ago, something <laughs> like that. I was a full-time orchestra musician in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we played the very first Pirates of the Caribbean. And it was a new concept then to mm-hmm. do these crossover films and live orchestra shows. And... Um, and, and I remember selling out 3,000 seats. We had a really big auditorium, had double balconies and things, and, and just the roar of the crowd and how exciting that was. That when I was at my first college in Kansas, I thought, boy, could we just bring this kind of energy to our campus? And we had a smaller community orchestra there. It wasn't as big as the Shoal Symphony Orchestra. And I, I remember um, going to ask um, you know, the board at that time, you know, because that's something we could do. And we looked at the price and, oh, my gosh, $75,000, $80,000. There's just no way. It just wasn't mm-hmm. possible there. Mm-hmm. And so when I came to, to UNA, you know, probably at that time that was probably our whole budget for the year. You know, it, it would have been almost impossible then here as well. Um, and, and so I, I, I worked with the board and I said, you know, is this possible? Should we look into it? They said, well, let's just look into it. Let's find out what happens. So I, I called Disney LA and the man on the other side of the line who's sole purpose is just to coordinate these shows with professional orchestras. I mean, London Symphony and Chicago Symphony and, you know, the Boston Symphony, all these major orchestras. The same person that contracts these shows, I, I get to talk to on the phone. And his no- name was Royd Haston. And I said, Royd, you know, you know, uh, we're, we're looking at doing the show. And he was saying, you know, normally we start with 35,000 royalty. So basically, you know, if you don't, you can't even talk in that ballpark. You could tell agents are used to saying, well, we'll just hang up here. If you, you know, if that's too yeah. big, don't even think about it, you know. And I started to tell him about our story a little bit. And I said, I'm, you know, from UNA. And 
He said, UNA, oh my gosh. He says, that, that's my alma mater. I, that's where I went to school. And I wow. said, what? How is that possible? <laughs> He's, he says, I haven't been back to campus in 20 years. So he, here he had gone through the commercial music program uh, at, we're proud of here at UNA, inter, now entertainment industry. And then he did an internship, I think, through Nashville a little bit, and then he went out to L.A. That turned into his full-time job, and that's where he stayed for 20 years. Well, now he's in charge of these concerts live, you know, as, as yeah. part of their contracting side and coordinating, shipping out music and all these things for these shows. And uh, so he worked behind the scenes. And I tell you, I, it had to have been for four or five months because he was working on the L.A. side, and then he'd have to go contact Disney New York City because that's where they have what they call the worldwide calendar of Disney. Wow. Um, and, and so he was working behind the scenes on her behalf. And Disney's really unique because they, they, they make sure they never uh, overfill their market, okay? So, for example, if um, Disney on Ice is having mm -hmm. some show in Huntsville, they will not let us have our movie show within the same month because they want everybody to go to both, right? Yes. They, they want people and take their kids to all these shows. So they had to check all these calendars. And uh, when he came out came back thanks to his generosity um, I'll just put it in very general terms our full production budget went from that 70 eighty thousand to about half that cost because of what he was wow. able to do behind the scenes and and I can say it's thanks to him not only did we get that first opportunity but it's led to these other movie mm -hmm. shows that we've done um, also because Disney was never known to come to this small of a market, you know. Yeah. Dis Disney would say, well, I've got to have a city at least as big as Huntsville or bigger if we're going to bring in the Disney name in a show. Um, you know, you got to think back. Have they ever had a Disney on Ice here or anything like that? Yeah. You know, they, they haven't, right? Yeah. And when we go to those big arena rock concerts, where do people go? They go to Huntsville. They go to Birmingham, Nashville, you know. And so this was really a, a, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that Roy provided to all of us, the campus, to the whole community, um, by saying, you know, we're combining and saying, hey, Disney, you know, a big, big and T like Disney who makes all this money, you know, mm -hmm. hey, guys, we, let, let's give this, this college a shot. Um, they're going to be great. They're a professional-level orchestra, um, but, uh, but we need to make sure that it's economical enough for them. And I can tell you, since we started that, what's fascinating is now um, now they have put a new agent in the middle, a professional agent, IMG artists, that help contract these Disney shows. So as I've always said, we, we started a trend because the, you know if you weren't the Nashville Symphony or Huntsville Symphony, they weren't going to give you that opportunity. And so we were the smallest orchestra at the time they ever gave the chance. And now since they've put an agent in the middle, that's not going to give us the same good deal that Roy Haston was able to manage behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So because of it, we were probably the first and the last to get this good of a deal. And because of it, we've continued that trend and been able to bring up more Disney shows. And then Home Alone was our first step into 20th Century Fox, mm -hmm. which was the new movie company. And they were able to match a pretty comparable rate to bring down their rates. They, they keep pulling us up a little bit every year. You know? <laughs> they, they, want, they want their money. But, but I, I am so thankful that it was because of Royd and an alum of yeah, DNA made it happen. It's, it's pretty cool, pretty that's magical. That's fascinating, that whole story. Um, while we're talking about that, I kind of want to talk about all the you know, the different movies you've done, like Home Alone, yep. and you're about to do the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest here on May 4th. That's right. Um, is there a process that you guys use to choose these movies? Uh, you know, um, the, <laughs> For, for one thing, there's only so many movies available mm -hmm. to do this way. Now, the, the library keeps growing very rapidly, um, but D Disney once told me that it takes even post-production. So the movie is done. It's already been through the theaters, right? Mm -hmm. They say it still takes about a million dollars worth of labor to get it to the point where it's ready to do live with an orchestra. Wow. Now, that seems funny, right? Because they made the film with a live orchestra, so why does it take a million dollars after the fact? Well... Um, a lot of it's, it's like the post-editing, right, that you talk about you're doing all the time, right, is that, um, for example, in the, the actual sheet music for Pirates, it calls for seven or eight French horns, right, and it says um, play triple forte, play really loud, but then in the film, because Johnny Depp is talking, they have to pull it back with the, you know, yeah. they take the track and they pull it soft, so I'm like, okay, how do I get eight horns to sound super, super soft, you know, when they naturally play louder yes. right yeah. so there, there's a lot of things that an editor has to go back and take all of that music that may have just been scribbles on a page you know mm. 
for the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra and, and actually send it through a professional layout program so that we can, most orchestras can read the music, they have to adjust those dynamics so that we change the volume, um, and then they've got to go back on top of the movie and place a click track, okay? So you know click tracks, bands use them all the time, right? So I have an in-ear monitor, and so for the whole, this is, this is a two hour and 49 minute movie, it's a very long, a lot of material this time, but I just have that click in my ear all the time, right? And so I, I have to conduct to it and stay right with it, and the orchestra has to stay right with me. And what's so neat is the music is just perfectly timed to action, right? It may be with a sword fight or chains being dropped or cannons about to be shot off. And so, uh, you know, the orchestra could build to that moment, and then right before something happens on scene, it may just cut out or, you know, it's timed just right. So wow. it's up to us to stay right on that beat the entire wow. time. That's actually, that's really cool. So the orchestra itself consists, like you said before, of students, that's right. faculty members. And I know that sometimes you guys will even play with some higher level, you know, musicians from Huntsville and Nashville as well. That's right. Um, how do you think this is kind of like a, do you, let me rephrase that. Do you say that this is kind of like a stepping stone for these students to, you know, get like a foot into the professional world. Yeah, very much so. I mean, if, if a student dreams to be in an orchestra full time, uh, like I was fortunate to be back uh, in 2001, 2002, around that time, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very competitive market. Like if you could imagine um, a not very exciting version of American Idol or something, right, where you have lines and lines of people that want the one job, the one win, right? Um, professional orchestras are very much the same way. Um, my, my brother's a professional orchestra musician in Colorado Symphony as well. And he said they just opened up an audition for one spot in their orchestra and had 150 people sign up for it. Wow. And so you go through rounds. You go, you go behind a screen. Your first time you play some of the music you've been asked to prepare. They may just hear you for five minutes. You may have spent six months preparing and your own money to fly out there and stay in a hotel. And then they say five minutes later, thank you, you can go home. You know, we didn't even look at you, but we don't need to hear you anymore. You're done. And that's the stress of trying to make a full-time orchestra job. Um, and then they'll bring back out of the 150, maybe 40 of them will come back into a second round behind a screen. And then 10 may come to the third round. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they may take down the screen and watch them play and interact with them a little bit. But um, it's a very stressful world to try to break into something professionally. Um, but uh, I'm thankful that our, our program here academically has really given students th the best possible chance of the experience of moving in that direction. Um, so, for example, we have auditions coming up for the Shoal Symphony Orchestra here in April, April 17th and 18th, and it's open to not only university students, but it's open to the entire community at large. So I'm getting people from Huntsville and Nashville that are contacting me now saying, I'd like to come and audition on those dates. And I said, wonderful. Um, you know, for the professionals out of town and for our faculty professionals, um, they are paid at a certain rate. We call it a per-service rate. Um, and uh, we'd like to keep pushing that higher. We're, we're not quite on the plane of like a Huntsville Symphony yet, but someday we, we dream to be. Um, and then for the UNA students, we're, we're so fortunate that they have some performance award money that we're able to award for those that make the orchestra. Um, and uh, it's not, like I say, a guarantee that they get in there. And uh, mm -hmm. we've finally grown large enough in just about every section of the orchestra where um, we're going to probably have a, a training orchestra, a repertory orchestra is what we call it, next year where students that may not make it this time, they'll get an opportunity to grow in their skills and try to get up and oh, play that's with awesome. them. That's really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. And so for those people that you know, um, are aspiring to be part of the um, symphony or actually look up to the symphony, um, and even those that want to pursue a profession in music, what advice do you have for those people? Uh, practice all the time. That's what I've, I mean, you know, it's funny because, you know, as a high school student, I kept telling myself, you know, I, I just know I'm going to go into the professional music world. That was my dream. That's what I'm going to do. Um, and I took all those, uh, we, there were a bunch of IB classes, right? So you have AP, IB, they're, they're all very advanced, and you take these tests at the end of them. And I took as many as I could, and I was very academically challenged and was fortunate to, to get that education. But in the end of the day, I'm like, but if I wanted to be in a full-time orchestra, I should have been practicing more hours, you know, instead of, I, I was doing these extremely, extremely hard chemistry classes and, and English and history classes, things that would take, you know, that would make me not sleep all night long. I was studying, but I'm like, if there's anything that to stay up for, if you want to be a professional musician, it's the practice time. Um, and you have to be 
just the absolute best at what you do and to be able to handle the nerves well. I mean, that's something, you know, you never anticipate is you could play extremely well and be a great teacher and be a great player, but then all of a sudden you're put out on a big stage behind a screen by yourself and you have to just play impeccably perfect that first time. And that's a stressful place to be for, for anybody. Um, so we try to give that experience to the students when they audition for the orchestra here. Um, and then to get to sit next to professional faculty that perform in other professional orchestras. So they're bringing advice, they're the ears of a section, they can say, hey, we need to do this better. And, and that's something that most university students will not get in their university programs. Yeah. We're, we're very fortunate here. I also think that, like you were saying, earlier about the training orchestra that you guys might be able to put on. I think like if you, even if you don't make it into the uh, into the you know the big orchestra, I think if there's an opportunity for you to be part of that you know that training orchestra, you have, you need to take that chance as well. And don't you know be don't let it get in your head and you know make it make it seem like you're not good enough because just because you're not, you know, what the orchestra is looking for doesn't mean you're not good. You That's just right. have to practice more. That's right. Like and what's saying. what's unique about this scenario too is that students, when they enroll in orchestra, they can enroll in the same credit regardless of which orchestra they'd be put in, which means that at times they could even be rotated in and out of the professional orchestra. So you know, if a student is on the line and we have two or three students that are kind of competing for that spot. Maybe one student would play one series, another student play the next series, and mm -hmm. you know they may have some rotation going on throughout the year too. Um, we, we've had a, a large slew of students interested in starting string instruments since the. I've got wonderful faculty colleagues. Uh, Christina Volstomakin is our concert master and violin professor at the university. Uh, Thomas Maternique Pere, he's from uh, originally from France. He is our cello professor and just very down to earth. Students love him to death, um, and he's been doing great work. Um, and so we, we have had a number of students on campus just say, can I start cello? Can I start violin, viola for the first time? Um, and we're like, sure you can. And we've been able to find a little bit of scholarship to help them in those studies. Um, but this kind of training orchestra concept would be a great place for them to get their feet wet also, while some of the younger students that have several years of experience could get more of those leadership skills, I think, before they're ready to to play in the professional orchestra. Definitely. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but we really want to thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I mean, it's been a really good talk that we've had here. Yeah, I really appreciate yeah. it. I, I just want to encourage everybody to get the, the Pirates tickets soon. Definitely. We've already sold about 850 seats, um, so it's a, about half the auditorium is wow. set already. Um, I'm, I'm so thankful some UNA students are going to have vouchers for 250 free student tickets. Oh, nice. So uh, that should come out here in a couple of weeks in the GUC. Um, but otherwise, uh, adult tickets 25 to $35. Mm -hmm. uh, st uh, students, children 15, and can find them online. Just, yeah. just Google it. They can find the website pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. Well, make sure you guys go buy those tickets. Like he said, they're going fast. Um, he said you can buy them online. You can also buy them at their ticket office. It's down on Court Street over by Subway. Um, mm -hmm. Go check it out. And um, and also, uh, don't forget the Pirates of the Caribbean, the movie, the, the event. It's actually on May 4th at 7 p.m. Don't forget to uh, remember that. And there's also um, a event coming up on April 6th at 7 p.m. in the Kennedy Douglas Center here at Florence. It's called WC da Daiquiris and Daydreams. Um, make sure you come to that, too. So. Okay. Thank you guys hey. for watching. Great Thank to you be with you. Coming. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Make sure you guys check us out on all of our social medias, mm -hmm. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Listen to our other podcasts, Podbean, and on iTunes as well. And thank you guys for watching so much. I hope you enjoyed. This podcast has been brought to you by UNA School of the Arts, produced by Mark Gallegos and Lainey Green. Special thanks to Monica Collier and the SOTA staff.